All right, church, let's go ahead. Let's find our seats. Hallelujah. Let's start our time of praise and worship this Sunday morning. We want to invite you to lift your hands, raise your voices, because this morning Jesus Christ is worthy of the praise. So let's glorify and magnify the name of Jesus. It is good, it is good, it is good to give thanks to the Lord on high. To sing of your faithfulness and loving kindness both day and night. To play on our instruments sweet songs of praise for the things you do. It is good, it is good, it is good to get. Let's go ahead, let's stand together. For though the wicked spring up like the grass and are everywhere, soon they will perish, for all those planted in your house will grow without end. Sing it again, it is good, it is good, it is good to give thanks to the Lord on high. To sing of your faithfulness and loving kindness both day and night. To play on our instruments, sweet songs of praise for the things you do. It is good, it is good, it is good to give thanks to you. For though we struggle, for though we struggle in trials and troubles still come our way. You won't forsake us, your word has told us, your promises will never end. Let's sing it again, it is good, it is good, it is good to give thanks to the Lord on high. To sing of your faithfulness and loving kindness for day and night. To play on our instruments, sweet songs of praise for the things you do. It is good, it is good, it is good to give thanks to you. So why give Him praise? And why should we sing? Then why give Him thanks? And why celebrate? Then when should we thank Him? In what circumstance? It ain't always easy. But it is good, yes, it's good, it is good, it is good. Let's sing it again. It is good, it is good, it is good to give thanks to the Lord on high. To sing of your faithfulness and loving kindness both day and night. To play on our instrument, sweet song of praise for the things you do. It is good, it is good, it is good to give thanks to you. It is good. It is good, it is good, it is good to give thanks to you. Let's sing it one more time. It is good, it is good, it is good to give thanks to you. Word of God tells us it is right to give him thanks and praise. So let's continue on. Si tuvieras fe como un grano de mostaza. Es solo dice el Señor, si tuvieras fe como un grano de mostaza. Es solo dice el Señor, tú le dirías a la montaña, muévete, muévete. Tú le dirías a la montaña, muévete, muévete. Esa montaña se moverá. Esa montaña se moverá, esa montaña se moverá, esa montaña se moverá. Si tuvieras fe como un grano de mostaza, eso lo dice el Señor. Si tuvieras fe como un grano de mostaza, eso lo dice el Señor. Tú le dirías a la montaña, 
continue on church we're going to sing that song Jesus move let's lift our voices he's worthy this morning let's sing that song together as we raise our voices as we usher in the presence of the Lord let's sing it together let the power of God fall down on us let your power fall down right now let the power of God fall down on us let your power fall down the Spirit of God, let the Spirit of God pour out on us. Let your Spirit pour out right now. Let the Spirit of God pour out on us. Let your Spirit pour out for your glory, for your glory, and you only. What you say is what we'll do. Let your passion become action. Holies, come on, let's sing it together. We're alive. In Jesus, we're alive to glorify your name. And let your spirit rise among us now as we sing. Let's sing it again. We're alive. In Jesus, we're alive to glorify your name. And let your spirit rise among us now. Let your love come alive. Let the love of God. Let the love of God come alive in us. Let your love come alive right now. Let the love of God come alive in us. Let your love come alive. For your glory. For your glory. And you only. What you say is what we'll do. Let your passion become action. Holy Spirit, God, Jesus, we're alive. Jesus, we're alive to glorify your name. Let your spirit rise among us now as we sing. Let's sing it again. Jesus, we're alive. Jesus, we're alive to glorify your name. And let your spirit rise among us now. We sing, Jesus move. declare it this morning. We don't want to leave. We don't want to leave until we're changed. So here in our hearts, God have one more time. We don't want to leave because we don't want to leave until we're changed. So here in our hearts, God have your 
Jesus, we're alive to glorify your name. And let your spirit rise among us now as we sing. Jesus, we're alive to glorify your name. Let your spirit rise among us now as we sing. Jesus, move. Father God, we call on you this morning. Move in your place, Lord. I need you more. In more than yesterday, I need you more. More than words can say, I need you more. Then before I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Let's sing that again. I need you more. More than yesterday, I need you more. More than words can say, I need you more. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. More than the air. More than the air I breathe. More than the song I sing. More than the next heartbeat. More than anything. And Lord, as time goes by. I will be by your side I never want to go back to my own life Right here in your presence Right here in your presence Is where I belong This so broken heart has finally found a home Here in your presence Right here in your presence is where I belong. This old broken heart, this so broken heart has finally found a home. And I'll never be alone. I need you more. More than yesterday. Say, I need you more than ever before. I need you more. I need more than the air I breathe. More than the air I breathe. More than the song I sing. More than the next heartbeat. More than anything, and Lord, as time goes by, I will be by your side, cause I never want to go back to my own life. Right here in your presence, cause right here in your presence is where I belong. In this so broken heart, sing that chorus again right here right here in your presence is where I belong the soul broken heart has finally found a home never be alone and I'll never be alone I need 
need you more More than yesterday I need you more More than words can say I need you more Than ever before I need you more Let's continue to call out to him this morning, church. As we open our hearts, lift our voices.
one with the hiding, a reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again. My heart needs a surgeon, my heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, let's worship God. You are worthy. Amen. You know, we don't serve a God that's so far off. He is very personal, and he can come down in any situation that you're going through and meet you at your situation. Amen. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God to begin to help us this morning. We're so You can feel the presence of God. What a wonderful song service. You can feel God really helping us. We want to pray. We're going to ask God to begin to help us. We want to pray for Pastor Sunon Sanchez, uh, uh, Brother Ray Trejo, Richard Lugo, Steve Rodriguez. Pray for all these needs that are there. We also want to lift up uh, prayer, uh, uh, for prayer for the Pettis family, and healing, uh, need new helm. Also pray for Tracy and John for guidance. We need God, amen. We want to pray for this service this morning, that God's hand would be upon us ministering. And we need the presence of God. See, the presence of God can change every situation, amen. When God's presence falls, you may be going through something, but it can change in an instant. I believe God will begin to help us this morning. Let's begin to pray. Let's uh, God begin to help us. Our brother Rick Glenn is going to lead us to a throne of grace. Father God, we thank you for your mercy. All that you're going to do, we pray, Lord God, that you would help us. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. God, we lift up our needs before you, God. You are our Father that we can run to you, Lord, with everything that we have, and we give it all to you this morning. God, we ask your anointing, God, upon this service. God, we ask for a healing touch, God, for our brothers and sisters that need a touch from you. For Pastor Sanon Sanchez, Lord God, that you would touch him mightily, Lord God. Bring deliverance in his body, God. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're going to do in this service, God. We ask your anointing upon the preaching. God, open up our hearts and minds to your word, and we thank you for everything that you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. When we stand in the name of Jesus, tell me who can stand before us. When we stand in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. Praise God. Uh, we want to welcome everybody out to the door. It's good to see you here in our Sunday morning service. If you're a visitor, we're glad you're here. If you are uh, joining us online, we're glad also that you're participating. Uh, we're really blessed to have with us today and tonight Pastor Fred Ruby from London, England. Hallelujah. Uh, and uh, he and his wife Norma are here. And uh, we're really looking forward to a great, great day. You don't want to miss tonight's service. I know being here this morning, I was asking him. He has not been here since they uh, went to London, I believe, in 2017. And, uh, and so uh, it's going to be a great, great day of ministry. You're going to fill the conference uh, this week here in our service today. And then I want to remind all the men, tomorrow night we are having a men's discipleship at 730 right here. Encourage all the men uh, to be here for that. How many know uh, in this generation, we need men to be men of God. And so I encourage you to be here. We'll be joined by other churches tomorrow night, 730. Our regular prayer schedule goes on each weekday morning, 530, 8 o'clock. We pray back here. If you come in the morning for prayer, you come and park in this area and go through those doors right there. Wednesday night, we will be here at 730. Prayer meeting an hour before at 630. And then on uh, looking ahead to... Uh, uh, Saturday, our Overcomers Prayer is Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. That's next door. And then Saturday night, we're going to have another installment of our indoor drive-in. Uh, I think that's going to be our new name for it. And uh, we have an excellent movie. Many years ago, I read a great book called Unbroken, the story of Louis Zamperini, his amazing life, and his amazing conversion. And I understand they made a Hollywood movie, but they didn't. They left out the most important part. And so we're going to show part two to that, which is all about the most important part, a very powerful 
testimony of his conversion. They have a trailer ready. I Give me a thumbs up here. Are we good? No, we don't have a trailer ready. Tonight we'll have the trailer. Hey, take my uh, word for it. Two thumbs up. I read the book. It's a powerful, powerful story of his conversion. This guy uh, ran in the Olympics, uh, was considered to be the greatest miler in the world, and then World War II broke out, uh, uh, was stranded for, I think, 102 days, something like that, in the Pacific Ocean, finally picked up by the Japanese, where he was in an internment camp for, for years and years. He was in there so long, they sent a letter to his family that he was dead. Came back after all of that and was powerfully saved. You don't want to miss this. This will be a Saturday night. And so uh, we want to encourage you to come. And most of all, bring somebody with you. Invite them to come out. Uh, and an excellent, excellent uh, presentation of the gospel. And so you can remember that. So since we don't have a trailer, then we're going to move quickly on. We, we just came out of the conference. Uh, uh, lots of people were able to go and be a part of that. For time's sake, we had a lot going on today. I want to hear two testimonies. We're going to hear from uh, Dart Myers and also uh, from Brian Consider. And so, Dart, you come on up here first, and then, Brian, you're next, and uh, they're going to give. And uh, for the record, these guys got home at 3 o'clock in the morning, so uh, they'll, they'll stay awake. Well, first off, I just want to start by thanking Pastor Ruby and Ms. Yolanda for the opportunity to go to this conference. Um, just to be honest with you, church, uh, going into this conference, I was kind of at a spiritual plateau. wasn't really getting anything at this point, um, but we know that God is a faithful God, and he knows what we need when we need it. I spoke to Pastor Ruby, and he sent me to this conference, um, and he really touched my life. Um, I just want to let you know, church, we're blessed to have the pastors that we have. Pastor Martinez wasn't even supposed to preach at this conference, and he took charge, and he came in, preached a powerful sermon um, Pastor Ruby as well, with on extraction. I know we heard it here, but you didn't hear the conference version. That version was Holy Ghost fire. You have to go and see it, watch it for yourself. But so I don't sound biased, I uh, picked a couple that weren't our pastors. Um, so I picked uh, the couple was Pastor Greg's uh, first sermon, which was on Monday. It was on the theme of the conference. It was fanning the flame. Um, basically just went over things that we need so we can get that Holy Ghost fire. Um, and one thing that really stuck out to me that he said was the Holy Spirit ignites holy desires. So church, if we don't have holy desires in our life, if we just have carnal desires, we just go around doing things that we want, not the things of God, the Holy Ghost is never going to give us that fire. So in order for us to get that fire, we have to want the things of God. Um, the second sermon that really stuck out to me was also Pastor Mitchell's man. He is Man, the leader of our fellowship is a powerful preacher. That place, Prescott, God is really doing something there. Uh, it was called Go Ye. So this is for, it's, and I thought this was just going to be a sermon for people who are going to go preach the gospel in the nations, but this is for everyone. Basically, he said, going is our mission, going is our method, and going is our might. These things we... Spiritual reduction or reproduction is what discipleship is all about. We need to go and we need to outreach. We need to go and witness to people. Um, we need to give to world evangelism. And to be completely honest with you, I really wasn't going to very many outreaches. I wasn't witnessing to too many people, and that's probably why I hit that spiritual plateau. But this conference ignited a fire in my life that I had when I first got to this church. And I'm excited for all the things that God is doing here for the things that God's doing in Prescott, for all the people that are getting sent out. There was around, if I'm not mistaken, around 20 ish churches that are getting sent out, people that are coming back, people that are going, people that are swapping. There was, I think, nine churches that are going into the nations. And I'm excited for all things that God's going to do. Just thank everyone that went with me, Joel, Brian, Rito. They helped keep me in line while I was there. And we all just helped each other. Um, it really helped me because Honestly, on Monday, if I had my choice, I would have just stayed in and slept because we did a 16-hour drive, and it was not fun. But they helped me. They got me up. We got each other up, and we kept each other in line, basically. So I just want to thank Pastor Ruby and Yolanda again for this opportunity to go, and God's doing great things in Prescott. Conference was awesome last night, uh, all this week. Uh, God did some great things this week. I do think our pastor for investing in us, 
you know, God is a good God. He wants to use each one of you guys to reach this world for Jesus because our world is falling apart. It's falling, it's falling into all kinds of troubles. It's like this, but it needs to hope in the gospels in Jesus Christ. I want to tell my friends that um, in us, like I've been saying about this week, they've been saying we are inadequate. It's not in our own strength. It's in God's strength. It's in his power and his spirit that he wants to use each one of you guys. There's a different voice that God wants to use you. That's in his and that's going to, you open your mouth and speak the gospel. Don't be afraid of uh, our, our fears will hold us back from things. But be, be bold be, uh, and tell your uh, neighbors, your coworkers, your, uh, the people at the stores, at the banks or wherever you're at. Go tell them that Jesus Christ is life. He has the power to, to bring deliverance. I want to tell my friends I, um, that um, I am grateful for this, this uh, conference. I, do, I, I thank God for, uh, that God could use me my own limitations and everything. And I, one thing I'm, I'm grateful for is I'm able to give also to this conference. Thank God for Pastor Ruby for helping me to do that more so. Um, but um, guys, thank you. Hallelujah. So we appreciate that. And uh, so all you that drove in all night, stay awake. We're going to have a great service. And um, But it was a tremendous, tremendous time of ministry. Uh, I just want to go over the announcements and we're going to take an offering in just a moment here and uh, so uh, out of this conference there were nine international churches that were planted and uh, uh, I'm just going to read out the name and perhaps you have a family member who lives there Sinuik, Cambodia uh, Vientian, Laos Amborvi, Mahajanga, Madagascar Kali, Colombia Ambo, Kidratrimo, Alamanga uh, Madagascar, and also Bogota, uh, Colombia, and we thank God for that. But uh, I want to just really highlight three new churches into Fuzhou, China, Chaimen, China, and Tianjin, China. We're going back to China. Hallelujah. And that is very, very significant that we're going back to China. I'm going to get back to China, but in America, Charlotte, North Carolina, Kansas City, Missouri, Stanton, California, Fresno, California, Central El Paso, Redwood City, California, Phoenix, Arizona, Anthony, Texas, Leander, Texas, and Ocean Point, Hawaii, all new churches there. And so we thank God uh, for all of that. So uh, I, uh, this, some of you may remember back in 2011, it was the first opportunity I had. I had preached in 2010 in Malaysia in the rally, and they had about 30 people from China there. And uh, so the pastor asked me if I would come. I remember coming. Some of you remember it was, we, were, we, we weren't sure. I remember I did not take a Bible or anything like that. Uh, we didn't know how it was going to work going over there. And so I only had uh, my Blackberry at the time because we, were, we weren't sure. Anyway, at that time, our fellowship, I think we had five churches, three to five churches, two of them that were, had significant growth, meaning they had you know, several dozen people, and uh, and uh, God just moved. It wasn't a rally. It was what God was doing, but by the end of the decade, we had 33 churches in China. Many workers, uh, this congregation launched, uh, I think, overall six couples had gone into China uh, to labor there and to contend, and we were just part of our fellowship, and then uh, uh, COVID, and everything changed, and all foreigners, before it was over, every one of our foreign pastors was kicked out of the country. And Brent was the last one. And, uh, but I remember one of the things I never forgot in the book, Citizen Soldier, Stephen Ambrose said that the men who actually entered Berlin at the end of World War II were not even in the military on D-Day or they were stateside. And that if you're going to win a war, you can't just have a single invasion. There has to be a second invasion. And I believe God is giving us a window back into China. And I want to encourage you, we are very involved and committed to Vietnam, but we want to see God move in Asia. And this statement, these three churches going to China, I believe is a statement from God to the devil that we're going to take that land. These pastors that were there, these Chinese pastors, I remember preaching to them and saying, one day the window will close, and you guys better get all you can while you can. And these guys have stood by the stuff. They have stood through everything that's happened there, and they are asking for help. So I want to encourage you, be praying for China.
praying for Vietnam, Southeast Asia, that part of the world. It, most of the world lives. If you ever look at a map that's colored by population, most of the world lives in Southeast Asia. That is where the souls of men are, and God is opening doors there, and we need to make sure that we stay on top of it. Can you say amen? Let's have our ushers come. We're going to honor God in our giving this morning. You know, it's a miracle to see what God is doing. I had the chance to sit next to a very interesting man on the way home yesterday. This guy was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, and that's what got our conversation going. But we began to talk, and he was just asking me about our church, our ministry, our fellowship, and, and I was just sharing with him, and it was so interesting. This is a man of very high achievement in life, and, uh, but he was so moved by, by the, what God has done and what our God has done through our fellowship and the miracle of conversion and just coming, coming home from conference, but just tell me about it. It's like, this has been, a, this is a miracle. I hope you understand that this isn't, we're not into religious programs here. God is doing something and you and I are privileged to become a part of that. And I want to encourage you that just like we were saying in Sunday school, every single person in the church matters. And every single person in the church, the devil whispers to them, you don't matter. You're not important. You're not significant. And then you look at what God has done, and all of us stand back, and we, like those 24 elders, cast down our crowns and say, this is all God. That you and I get to be a part of it. Let's honor God with our tithes, our offerings. Let's remember our missionaries that depend on our faithful giving to continue preaching the gospel around the world. As our heads are bowed, Bill, will you ask God's blessing? And give, and it will come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shake again. Oh, the dollar again, it will come back to you. When you give, get to the Lord. Give in love, give in faith. Give a joy and smile on your face. Give as the Lord has given to you. All you give is a reflection of your gratitude. Yeah, it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shake it and rain. Run it over again. It will come back to you. When you give, give to the Lord. From your heart, give your best. Give unto God and you will be blessed. Don't be stingy, don't be tired. Learn from the widow in the Bible who gave her last my gift. And it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shake it again. Run it over again. And it will come back to you. When you give, give to the Lord. Amen. Thank you, musicians, singers. We appreciate that. And so uh, it's, a, it's always a great honor to introduce uh, my brother, Fred. If you're new here, that last name's not a coincidence. And uh, uh, all of us were saved uh, many, many years ago, back in 1979, um, uh, by a miracle of God's grace. And the older I get, the more I appreciate the miracle of that. Uh, uh, pastor Fred has been a pastor now uh, for almost 40 years. Uh, ministered in Las Vegas, New Mexico, pioneered and built a church in the heart of San Francisco uh, and served with Pastor Warner for many years and is now the leader in South London. Uh, I was there for their Bible conference back in April, had a tremendous, tremendous conference, great work that God is doing there. And so uh, we're blessed to be able to capture him for a couple of days. Let's welcome as he comes to preach. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Uh, greetings from uh, some, from London. Uh, we're here. Um, it's been a while, and you guys, have, a lot of wonderful things have happened here. And this obviously is one of the flagship churches of our fellowship, and very honored to be here with you. Um, as uh, Pastor Richard was saying, Norma and I have been in London actually officially since May 2018, 
And uh, we had, you know, from time to time, you got to work out visa things. And so uh, I got a, we have a little situation right now. The English are very nice about it. They said, Mr. Ruby, you can elect, elect to embark if you wish. And that means, uh, let me translate that. You can get the heck out of our country while we work this out. And uh, so that's the way you work out visa things. But we're having a great time, tremendous work of God. Like Pastor Richard said, he was at our conference. And uh, we, we just want to get the spirit of what you have going on here. Of course, I'm just looking around the building. This is amazing. Uh, what an amazing gift of God, huh? For God to work and do. He, I think he's honored this church and blessed this church for everything that you guys do. Uh, I'm looking at the platform. and I'm thinking this platform is big enough to host a wedding reception. Um, either that, quinceanera, bar mitzvahs, anything that you guys might need to raise a few extra funds. Uh, Marcus can play a little lounge music over here. I'm telling you, it will work. You even have the floor for it. <laughs> but, uh, hey, God is good, huh? Abundance. Texas, man, everything is big. So it's, it's great to be here. Um, I have a message this morning as we go to the Word of God. I call alt-religion. Alt-religion. And uh, basically, we're living in, in a day where these things are, uh, many different ideas are emerging. And... I think if you want to give one definition of religion, it would be a buffer, be, a, a buffer between uh, people and direct truth. This, any new convert knows that Christianity has its version of religion as well, alt-religion, where uh, you, know, you, you, you give your life to God, you just want to go forward in, in, in the gospel, and there's all kinds of religious buffers in the way. But ultimately, it's man, I think in, 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 in the worst sense, in the worst sense, it's man trying to shield himself from having to directly deal with the truth that comes from God. And uh, this is, uh, I'm going to read out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 here. I want to talk about alt religion here. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing uh, by the appearance of his coming. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Verse 11, therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I want to talk about alt-religion and what this means to our time. Now, I want to begin by referring to a story you may have read about. This took place at the end of April in Boston. It was called Satan Con. Now, you know how they have all these tech cons and these uh, comic book cons, those sort of things. Well, they had an event in, in Boston called Satan Con. And it was a sold-out event. It had over 800 people. It was at the Marriott Copley Place in Boston. And it was a three-day event. Now, I had a picture here of, of that. Um, it was a three-day event. And um, basically, this included satanic rituals. And this is what I'm bringing, that this is no longer behind, you know, a curtain. This is now at a venue, a very popular venue in Boston. And, it, it, and they began their weekend conference on April the 28th with the tearing apart of the Bible while the crowd chanted, Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Now, this is astonishing to me. Now, we know you hear about this stuff that happens. But like I'm saying, somewhere this is beginning to emerge in a way that I never thought I would probably see in my lifetime. You always hear these things in terms of whispers, you know. But now... There's, there is a coming out of sorts, of an alternative to honoring and worshiping God. G.K. Chesterton, he's a great English thinker, he said when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. 
And so when you find, you find this with the gospel, right? Whenever the gospel is being preached and ministering, many times people recoil from the gospel. They don't just say, hey, listen, I'm just an atheist. Leave me alone. I'm agnostic. How many know people, they run to some other idea? And so this is what we see going on today. I'm telling you, it, it is, it's astonishing. And it's, the, the absurdity of it is overwhelming. You think people would never actually say this out loud, but they are. I was reading another article. I'm going to refer to a couple here. Uh, there, is, there is now a revival, and I'm not making this up, of Jediism. You heard that right. Star Wars. In uh, Australia alone, they claim to have over 70,000 uh, followers of Jediism. And uh, it's about, you know, uh, uh, you know, the monastic cult in, in, in Star Wars. You know, the force be with you and, and, and lightsabers. And, uh, you know, and they're actually, I have a photo of this guy. Is a, I mean, you get that from Walmart. It doesn't even work. Yet that somehow <laughs> this, this person is standing there with a serious face. This is what I believe in. It's an, it's, you don't believe in nothing. You believe in anything. Here's another one that coming up. This would have been absolutely ridiculous just a, a decade ago. UFOs. They're actually starting to talk seriously about UFOs now. Now, I can't believe this is, there's a little bit of distraction in this strategy, but um, I saw the clips myself on YouTube. I, I was in England, but I saw the clips of uh, NBC News leading two broadcasts, two broadcasts. Uh, uh, Lester Holt. This is Lester Holt. UFOs have been spotted. How many saw this? I was, I was shocked. I was thinking, doesn't this man have any self-respect to go into the producer and say, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but you know, uh, there's an article here, the BBC. I realize why they're promoting it. Listen to what the BBC article said. He said, if we made contact with aliens, how would religions react? Now you know the strategy, don't you? In other words, it's an alternative to have believing in God. And the world is so desperately falling away from God today, they're willing to go to UFOs. What about radical environmentalism, climate change? Now, we, many of us have understood for a long time this has been a religion. But they've denied it. The science, the science, the science, you hear. And so I know you spend an afternoon in San Antonio in July and you could, you could believe this sort of thing. But I'm telling you, I was in Sacramento. It was cold, actually, over there. Um, but I have a, 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 a photo here of Time magazine. Here's the reason. What does it say? The case for making Earth Day a religious holiday. We knew they were religious the whole time. And now they're coming out of the closet. This needs to be a religion. All of it, if you, if you know God's word, is based on the idea that the world is rejecting truth. And so anything begins to sound acceptable. This is part of my testimony. Pastor Richard would remember uh, when Ray got saved, he started witnessing. We had a, a neighbor named Van Brown uh, who was a radical dude. And Ray, and they would just not leave us alone. They were tormented. Let me tell you something about your pastor. He, he kind of instinctively understood the truth about, uh, uh, about this. See, I'm about to share this story, and he's messing with the soundboard. Uh, but um, whenever Ray would start to preach, I would try to challenge him. And, and Richard would put his fingers in his ears and go, ah, and walk out of the room. I'm not listening. Because he kind of knew the truth would, would, would require something of him. And so I, when, when Ray started witnessing in our neighbor van, I chose an alternative religion. I chose uh, uh, the writings of Carlos Castaneda. Anybody ever read that? Yeah, like J Tales of Power, Journey to Islam. And so I remember telling Ray, I don't believe in that Christianity stuff. I believe in peyote, man. Peyote's my answer. And I wasn't old enough at that time to live the life of a peyote shaman. But that was what I said I wanted to do when I finally got my freedom, you know. Tales of power, that's what it's about. Not, not the Bible. Of course, thank God I got saved as a teenager and never got there. Jeremiah chapter 2 puts it this way. 
about God's people. He said, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, one, and two, hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So he's telling, something, he's telling us something very important about human nature. People don't just reject God. That's sin number one. Sin number two is that you go out and find an alternative, a, a much inferior alternative. And so what we see in this story is what I want to get to is that there comes a time as the scripture says, where God is going to send strong delusion upon people that continuously reject the truth. This, is, it, this should disturb you. Aren't there some things in the Bible that just disturb you? Like, why? wait a minute, God, you're for me, right? God, you want to bless me. God, you want me to be saved, right? Why would you allow a situation where you would let delusion grip my life. And this tells you something very important about man in our relationship with God, that God respects the free will, even to the point where it's scary. That God releases you or me to your own self-will. What did he say in Genesis? He said, my spirit, this is before the flood, he made an interesting statement. He said, my spirit will not always contend with man. And then he says, for his years are 120 years. So God says about his work in the human heart and the human that he works, he's got grace, he's helping, he sends people to, to witness, he sends, you know, he, he get, we go through things, he shows us his mercy, and he says, but I will not always wrestle with a person's self-will and intent to reject truth. That there comes a time when God says, that's what you want? Do what you want. No, you don't really mean that, do you? It's kind of like Home Alone. Remember the Home Alone? He wakes up, nobody's there, and you think he's going to freak out because he can't find anybody. Then he gets super happy. Now he can eat ice cream all night long and, and, and watch TV. And you know, a lot of people, that's what kids think, church kids. They grow up in church, and you think, oh, when I turn 18, I'm going to do this. And you think every, you know, you think every single person in your school except you is a party animal. That's not reality, but you're going to do this and that. But you know, the prodigal son is actually a story of showing you how God's grace is, and mercy actually intertwines with human choice and decision. You know, the son said, give me my inheritance. And the father said, who's a type of God, right? Go. Go. Do your thing. Well, you don't really want me. No, God doesn't want you to do your thing. But he does respect the will, the, the, the will of, of, of man because that's what you choose to believe and to love God with. Verse 10, I refer to all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth. So we get confronted with truth. And in that moment, we are responsible to make a decision about truth. And that's what the conviction of the Holy Spirit is all about. Remember Jesus' encounter with Pilate. Pilate uh, was a worldly wise human being. In fact, you read about Pilate, he was one of those guys that potentially could get into Caesar's inner circle. And who knows, with a little palace intrigue, he might have become a Caesar, maybe in his mind. And so he's in the very presence of Jesus and Jesus says to him very clearly, whoever's on the side of truth believes in me. And, and what does Pilate say to him? He says, what is truth? What is truth? You know, he, he, he's so sophisticated, right? What is truth? And so Pilate then, you know the story, he, he decides, he knows Jesus is innocent, but he doesn't want to politically challenge the, 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 the mob. So he, he, he goes through the motions, you know, the little ceremony of washing his hands. And then he turns Jesus over to the mob. What I've always found fascinating, because we did a, um, a, a series in uh, Tucson, later I did it in South London, on the Apostles' Creed, is that uh, the, the part about uh, Jesus' death, it says, 
you know, Jesus was delivered uh, to death at the hands of Pontius Pilate. Now, the reason that's interesting is because Pontius Pilate thought he washed his hands of it. I wash my hands, he said. But yet Christians throughout the ages have repeated over and over again in the story of Jesus' death and resurrection that he was delivered at the hands of Pontius Pilate. I guess he needed better soap because truth does that to you. You think you're going to shake it? You don't shake it. And God says your decision in the worst case scenario, God says I accept your choice. In the better case scenario, it's like the prodigal son. He lets you learn from bad choices, right? And maybe you're here today, you're back sitting. You've learned some, from some bad choices. That's why you're here. You need to get your heart right with God. Romans 1.28 says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. I mean, this is the book of uh, Romans chapter 1 is the history of the world in one chapter. And it tells you what happened to man. Man came to a point, he thought he was all that and more, and, God, and he didn't no longer want to acknowledge God. And so God said, go for it, man. Do your thing. Be what you want to be. You don't want God? You don't, want to, you don't want to acknowledge where you come from. You don't want to acknowledge God's moral universe. You want to just, and the scariest part of this is that God lets people go sometimes. Most of us learn math, uh, we learn the Lord's Prayer. I'm not even going to ask for hands, but you know, we learn the Lord's Prayer when we were kids, right? Even the worst kid in catechism knew the Lord's Prayer, our Father. And, you, but there's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's really profound. I mean, it's the only prayer teacher, prayer t Jesus ever taught. But, you know, the line, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's an that's a incredibly profound statement about how we need to deal with ourselves. In other words, prayer needs to acknowledge the fact that we're vulnerable. That our vain imaginations, that our sinful imaginations need to be checked. And where there's even part of the prayer, God says, you better check your, 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 you better check your imagination to the point where you say, God, don't let me go down that path. Don't let me go down that road. Where you're actually taking a preemptive strike against your own backsliding in that statement. Because... It's saying, God, don't, don't give me over, Lord. Don't throw me. Don't say, okay, that's it. You say, God, be merciful. You know the best time to pray that way is when you're still sane. Instead of when you're all messed up, it's hard to pray that prayer. So here's, a, here's what I'll move on to, that not only are you alone with your own temptation and choices, there's a choir of, this, of delusion to encourage your rebellion against God. 1 Timothy chapter 4 says, The Spirit clearly says that in the latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. This is a fascinating prophecy. I've always been incredibly fascinated by this prophecy. Here's what I believe. You can say, uh, you, can, you can argue with me later, but I believe this is a prophecy of celebrity culture that, we, as we, as, that has only existed in the last hundred years, probably since film. There's a, there's a worldwide celebrity culture. I, I would call it depraved, hypocrite, celebrity culture. And these people have amazing influence over the minds of everyday people. Amazing influence. And if you don't believe they have that kind of influence, at, uh, then, then, then just look at how much they get paid to support products if you don't think they have that kind of influence. And it doesn't matter. And here's the interesting thing. Hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared. These people, they, they, they're, they're, they're just full of contradictions. Their, their lifestyles are completely debased. And yet, in a normal sense, if they were your neighbor or your cousin, you know not to listen to them. That guy's all messed up. You don't know what that guy's into. 
But because they're in lights and they're on television and, and they're, they appear in, in commercials, you think they know what they're talking about. And, that, and when people have turned against God, now they have these people representing the doctrines of, of hell against truth. And they, rep, they literally represent them like salesmen. And they're constantly uh, uh, putting them out there. And people believe this stuff because there's a program of strong delusion. How many people, you know, they get addicted to, to, to you know, movies. It's not just the, the content in the sense of, you know, uh, uh, questionable content. It's the fantasy that people get addicted to. You know, Proverbs says a, 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 a foolish man chases fantasies. And so we're talking about how people, they, they, they get caught up in these delusions and they follow these personalities and it doesn't matter who those personalities are. And this is the emphasis of that prophecy. These people that you think are so that, that they're, the, they're the lowest of the low and in any normal, you know, any normal uh, reading of human behavior. But because they're rich and they're beautiful and they got a lot of money, you think there's something special. And you follow them. I'm not even going to ask how many people are following them on Instagram. And you don't realize this is all part of the program. Strong delusion. Strong delusion. To make you think that your sin is good and it's okay. And that Christianity is this silly thing from the past that people are all caught up and bound in. And so here's, as I move on here, you're at the mercy of the momentum of this spirit. Strong delusion. It's a sweeping, it's, if you can imagine it, it's like a sweeping flash flood of, of power and influence. I'm talking to some of you young people. You had, you know, one of the best things you guys got going on, which I think is world known, is your boot camp. People all over the world try to model it after the San Antonio boot camp. But young people, you, this will sweep. You don't put your toe in a flash flood because it moves at such force. It will overwhelm you. It says, therefore God sent them strong delusion, verse 11, so that they may believe what is false. And so we know that it's not God wanting to deceive you, but at time to time, God lets let's. People want the devil, you have the devil. Let me give you an, another illustration here, Katy Perry. You know, Katy Perry was the second child of pastors, Keith and Mary Hudson. She grew up listening to gospel music and singing in church, she said when she was a kid. Uh, they were not allowed to eat devil's eggs, she said. They had to call them angel's eggs, and then they could... could, they could so, and she had an interview with uh, Marie Claire magazine a while back, and she made this statement. She said, I don't believe in heaven or hell or an old man sitting on a throne. I believe in a higher power bigger than me because that keeps me accountable. Now, let me just try to be fair to Katie just for a second. Okay, she's a church kid. You know, she's had to live under her parents' experience and now she's going to do her thing and she's going to figure it out for herself. So you think, yeah, okay, all things being equal, Kelly's going to figure it out. I mean, Katie's going to figure it out for herself. But how many of it doesn't really work that way? Because there are other forces besides you and your own imagination and your own sense of, uh, of self-determination. It's not just you and the universe. There are forces out there moving, uh, uh, deceiving, grasping. And so let me show you the next picture of Katie here. Now, I call this Katie's non-religion. How did this happen? I just want higher power, she says. And there you go. Now, now she's into this. How did she get into that? How, does, how do you go from here to here? My theory is there are other forces out there, folks, besides just you and your imagination. Once you yield yourself... There are things that move you that you can't even count on right now. Now, I noticed that she likes the Pope. There's an old man that sits on a throne that doesn't bother her too much. But um, <laughs> here's a, here, the, 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 you know what I mean? How does she go there? I just want to be, you know, higher power. But she ends up there. 
because you don't have a choice. I just want to sing songs about love. But now it's about, uh, I kissed a girl and I liked it. How do you end up there? Because you're not alone in the universe. That's why. There are other forces in play. And when people reject truth, this is the bottom line. People reject truth. You're at the mercy. Not just you. I don't believe in nothing. No, you believe in anything. Now I'm going to close with the idea here of valuing truth. Two things very quickly that I want to end with. How do you, how do you deal with the truth? There are two ways I think that are very important. To, to, if I can just reduce it down to this as we close. Number one is if you're going to value truth, it begins by rejecting the lie. Now, this is a really important idea. This was a revelation to me. Most of us find the truth by the process of elimination. Matter of fact, this is true science. Science, that's a scientific method right there. You reject what isn't true. And so here's what I mean. I mean, I don't mean that you, you had a science experiment and you said, you know, I need to be a Christian. I, you know, and that's not how it works. You had bad relationships. And you had to say fornication is stupid, right? That's how you get say You learn to do right. You judge the lie, right? You judge the lie of phony romance. Or you've done drugs and, you, oh, this is so fun. And then you see somebody lose their mind, another person die uh, in an OD. And you wake up and you say, that's a lie. You know, uh, one of the great uh, uh, in, in, in steps of every new convert is judging the lie. And you know why certain people backslide all the time? Because they always think, they always keep a little bit of, eh, it wasn't that bad. It was a lot of fun after all. You keep that attitude toward your sin, and, and you'll always have a little bit of the lie left over, like a little pilot light working inside of you for your next backsliding episode. No, you've got to reject the lie. That's a lie, man. You know, where maybe you were just religious before you got saved, but miserable and tormented and bound by, by hatred and, 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 you know what I mean, anger. And you say, no, no, religion, no, I don't want religion. That's just, that's, and you know how many people they get saved, well, I'm going to go back to something they never, you have to say, no, man, that's a lie. That's a lie. And so you have to develop a boldness to, re if you're going to have truth in your life, you've got to judge lying. And, and, and we call, how many, you know, if you've ever been in, in, in any kind of um, therapy or whatever, they call it denial. You know what, someone who has a problem with denial is someone that refuses to judge the lie. It's a lie. I'm not, I can't accept that. One of my favorite uh, stories about Abraham, this is not in the Bible, this is, uh, I took a course a while back and they talked about Abraham, this is a, a, a Jewish tradition. That Abraham found God by rejecting idolatry. He didn't just like, oh, God, show me. It was like he had an experience. Actually, when he was young, uh, he, he sought God in the sun, the moons, and the stars. And he decided that God wasn't in those things. And it talks about one story in particular where his father was an idol maker, according to the tradition. And he left Abra young Abraham in charge of the shop. And so Abraham's on this journey to figure out who God is. And um, while he's minding the shop, a woman comes in and presents uh, a, a basket of, of, of food to one of the idols. And, uh, you know, Abraham knew this was absurd. But, and so he can imagine a shop with all these different sized idols, and the woman presents a basket of food. And so he, he realizes this is, this is so ridiculous he takes a, a, a stick and begins to break all the idols, one by one, except for the largest one. And in the largest one, he puts the basket of fruit in front of the largest one. His father comes back to the shop, sees all this devastation, and he, and he said, what happened here? And Abraham said, well, uh, a woman brought this basket of food, and uh, they all started fighting over it, and the biggest one won. <laughs> and his father said to him, that's ridiculous. These these are, these, are, these are statues. They can't move. They can't fight. They can't speak. And Abraham said, aha. Uh -huh. I think that's where that Jewish aha uh -huh comes from. He said, absolutely. They can't do any of those things. Yet you are promoting these things like they're a God and they are false. That's one of their legends. And I said, wow, that's how you find truth, though. Sometimes you're not going to find it. Because, you know, just see, go to the top of a mountain. Start rejecting the lie. You'll, you'll find it. 
Now I want to close with one last thought, and that is embracing truth. If you do, there's a lot of people who do see lies, but you, you can't just leave it there. Because if you leave it there, you're going to become a cynic who eventually gets deceived by something else. There's a lot of people that they don't believe in nothing. You know what I mean? Everything's a conspiracy. That's where you'll end up. You must choose to believe God. Again, Joshua, as I close here, 24, 15 says, If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. I love this because he contrasts. He said, whether, whether the gods of your ancestors or the gods of the Amorites, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I like this. I, love, I like what Joshua said. Joshua, he didn't say, if you want to serve God, then do your thing. He said, no, no, no. The truth is, you're going to do your thing. You're going to go back to those other gods. You've got to choose God. Because like Bob Dylan said, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but ultimately your relationship to truth puts you in one place or another. You, the, this whole prophecy, as I close, is really about that you cannot stand where you want to stand because uh, that's just me. This is just you. I'll let you people work it out. You know, you ever seen those bumper stickers uh, uh, where they have all these different symbols? I think kind of like this. And, and, you know, get along. It says something like that. Like, yeah, yeah, they, they know. Like, I'm so independent of this. No, you're not. No, you're not. There's a force that's going to that's gonna polarize you. If you reject truth, anything goes. But I'm telling you one other thing before I close here. You can choose that free will that God gave you. It doesn't matter what your background is, where you come from, what you've been through. You can choose God. And that choice in the name of Jesus will set you free. So I want you to bow your heads with me this morning. We're going to pray. We're going to pray here. You know, as, as, as we uh, finish the service here, we just, every head bowed, every eye closed, we're going we're gonna to pray. You know, I, I, when I deal with a subject like this, you know, you don't know, like this aging guy upset about pop culture. But um, I think about stuff, stuff like that. How's this going to play? But I'll tell you, I got saved, as Pastor Richard said, we got saved as teenagers where we started to see through a bunch of things. There are a lot of stuff was going on. Start seeing through it. And so one of the things about getting, you know, serving God over 40 years, you know, you want to um, maintain that sense of it's not just about religion, it's about tr the truth. I, I rejected the lie, the big lie to serve God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said about himself. Jesus told Again, Pilate, whoever's on the side of truth is with me, Jesus said. And Pilate, it actually was before his time. He would probably represent the way a lot of people are today. What is truth? Oh, that's this. You guys like this. You guys like that. Jesus is the truth. And this is the only experience that can change you. Religion can't change you. Church can't change you. Liturgies can't change you. They might assuage you. They might make you feel better. Perhaps some people can feel that way. But it's not going to change you. If, you don't, if you're not right with God today, you need Jesus. He is the answer. He is the difference. We're not looking for another alternative. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father. But through him, Jesus is the sacrifice. And before we finish today, our heads are bowed. I believe in this, in this auditorium, there are people here, you're not right with God. And there's a warning. And I know every sermon can't be something like this, but there's a warning in, 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 our, in our spirits now. Things in the world are shifting quickly. Things are polarizing. People are afraid now. I mean, I'm talking about everyday people afraid to even say what they think. But I'll tell you right now, we have the answer in Jesus. We have the answer. Well, we don't have to fear the world. 
But we know Jesus is the answer. Pastor Ruby, the other Pastor Ruby, I'm, I need to get right with God. I, I hear the Holy Spirit convicting me right now about what's going on in our world. I'm, I'm, I'm playing games. I'm in the middle. Can I tell you something? You must choose. You can't just, you can't be an independent third party uh, in this dialogue too long. There are forces in play that will sweep you. And so you need to get right with God today. You, you're not saved. You need to be born again. I want you to put your hand up. Hold it over your head. Every head's bowed, but God is dealing with you. I want you to slip your hand up right now. All over this is auditorium. God bless you. God bless this hand. Anyone else? Slip it up. Amen. Over here. God bless this hand over here. God bless you. God bless these hands. We're, we're, we're in the presence of God. We're waiting. We're waiting. Maybe you're a backslidden Christian. I, I, I threw in the story of the prodigal son because you get to see both sides. This is very nuanced. God gives this kid up for a while to learn some lessons, and the kid comes back. It's, you don't want to learn your lessons that way, but that's life. But you're a backslider, and you've learned a few very, very harsh lessons. But God, Jesus loves you. He that has begun a good work is committed to that good work till the very, very end. But you have to repent and get right with God. You're a backslider. You say, Pastor, I'm going to get right with God. I've learned. I've learned. I did my own thing, and I want to get right with God. I want you to put your hand up. Quickly, join these. Amen. God bless those hands. Hallelujah. Anyone else before we... Those of you that, amen, over here as well. God bless you. All of you that have lifted your hands, I want you to stand to your feet with me. You lifted your hands. Stand up with me right now. God bless you. I want you to step out of your seats. Over here on my right, come on, I want you to come. We, we want to pray with you. This is one of the great privileges of, 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 of gospel ministry is praying with people to get right with God. Don't be embarrassed. God is so good. I need some workers here. How you doing today? Bless you. We need some workers here. God bless you. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Time to get right with God. Hallelujah. I want to talk to, you know, the saints just for a moment. We live in a time where, I'll go back to the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You know, that's a daily prayer. You know, that's a daily prayer. That means having to really, really stay on your toes as a Christian to be aware of ourselves, to be aware of our imaginations, to be aware of, of what's around us. And this is one of the best ways to not let religion grow between you and truth. Where God, I want to know the truth. So we're, we're going to stand to our feet. This altar's open now. We're going to worship God. We're... Lord, we need
and I know this is not for everybody, but I really feel the need to pray right now for courage in this, in this context. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. And standing up for God under this kind of pressure means just that. You have to, you have, to have a sense of standing, like, no, this is who I represent, right? I belong to Jesus. You know, a lot of witnessing, you think, uh, you know, it's, it becomes very complicated sometimes in our head. I got to have these, these nice quips, you know, or the Roman road and all that stuff. But a lot of really good witnessing is just you representing I'm a Christian. It starts right there, right? I go to church, me and my family together. And your, your testimony starts unfolding from that. But, it, but you have to have just the simple courage to represent yourself. I belong to Jesus. He's my Lord. And from there, a lot of it opens. It's not like having to have this, uh, you know, a sales pitch. You just are what you are. And if you have it, you can, you can, you can import it, right? Amen. And uh, the courage that we need. That's why Jesus said, if you confess me before men, you know, I'll confess you before my Father. And it's all boiling down to that. The pressures of the world trying to pin people down. And people saying, I don't care what happens. Jesus is Lord. And you say that's not very complicated. It's not, but I think that's the root of all real witnessing and standing up. It's just standing up. You are what you are, and you're not what you're not, right? Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Jesus, your Lord, Amen. then serve him. If it's the God of your ancestors, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, I want to tell you, I don't even have to tell you to do it because you're going to do it, and then you'll be lost in it, Right? But God is merciful. That's why the prodigal son story is so important. Sometimes people do get caught up in their own will, and the Lord pulls you back. Right? Jesus is married to the backslider. Can I tell you that? That's what it says in the Bible. God is married to the backslider. God doesn't forget you. He just says, repent, serve me. Learn to do right. I, I'm not stupid. I'm not doing that anymore. And I'll say it again. Some of you guys learn to reject lies. Start telling yourself the truth. That's a lie. When the old boyfriend calls you back and makes another promise, that's a lie. <laughs> yeah. Amen. You have to learn how to identify a lie. And then you have to have the courage to say that's a lie. To yourself. Let me tell you anybody, anything about to yourself. Remember, the word denial is the one you, that one word you always hear in therapy and all that. That denial means, I'll define it in, again one more time, people that refuse to define a lie are people that are prone to denial. They're denying lies. No, that's not a lie. Oh, no, that. But it's, okay, God, I want truth in the inward parts, Lord. And then you just embrace. Most importantly, you embrace Jesus, and he'll show you what's a lie, right? Okay, I want you to pray this prayer with you. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. We confess Christ. We confess Christ. And him crucified. You are our Lord. We follow you. We lift up your name. To you be all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. You are worthy of our hearts and our lives and our efforts. And we serve you and you only. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's just give God praise. Hallelujah. Father God, we give you praise right now. God, I pray for the power of your Holy Spirit, God. The power of your Holy Spirit right now, God, to quicken courage and dominion, victory and grace. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Pastor Miguel is coming. Uh, we'll be here tonight, and we're going to have a good time in the Lord. Pastor Miguel, you should have seen him in Prescott. He came up. He did a fantastic job. Amen. Message. There we go. <laughs> what a tremendous message we need this day. Amen. What I said, what a powerful. I said, so good. You're going to want to come tonight. Bring a visitor. Bring, I, you know, when he was talking about witnessing, I said, man, we need a witness. Bring someone, bring a friend, bring a family member. It's going to be a tremendous time tonight. You can feel the presence of God. It's like the momentum of Prescott Conference is perpetuating just in this morning service. You can feel God really upon the service. Come tonight. We'll be here. Come in prayer. We'll be an hour uh, before that at 6. 
uh, p.m. praying, laying hold of God. We're going to have a great time tonight. As we do this, every head, body, right, close, reverence to Jesus. As we do this, Brother Les Snot grabs even closest in prayer. <laughs>